founder. And we're also a couple. And I am a multiracial woman, black and white. And I identify as black or African American, although so many of us are mixed. So many of us are mixed. And that is the topic that we're speaking about tonight. Uh, we don't usually um, do books, and I guess we're not doing books. We're doing a sort of a conversation sort of about a book. Um, but we are so excited to about this one, and in particular because you all probably know Allison Briscoe Smith, um, who has been on um, with us many times since 2016, since we were ever, you know in the beginning when we didn't have that many folks tuning in. And uh, she, along with Rolina Joseph, wrote this great book called Generation Mix Goes to School, Radically Listening to multiracial kids. And uh, we're excited to have Allison back to be um, introduced to Rulina and to be having this conversation that I know a lot of you are going to want to have about the particular, um, the particular issues that multiracial kids face. And what's great about this book and about what you'll hear tonight is that these doctors, we'll call them doctors, because they uh, because are, they are doctors, um, have really listened and they'll talk to us about radically listening um, and will really bring us some of that tape, the voices of uh, multiracial kids, them speaking to their experience. And they also spoke to uh, caregivers and educators about how uh, they do or don't, you know, support multiracial kids so that we can have more, uh, we can have, think and have a conversation about how to best do that. So we're really excited. Let me introduce our guests. Yay. Dr. Allison Briscoe Smith is Come a clinical down. child psychologist who specializes in trauma and issues of race. She combines her love of teaching and advocacy by serving as a professor and directing mental health programs for children experiencing trauma, homelessness or foster care. An adjunct professor at the Wright Institute, much of Allison's work is with Bay Area schools and nonprofits as a clinician's, clinician, consultant, and trainer. Most importantly, most impressively, she's a multi-time guest on Talking Race and Kids. Five <laughs> times people, more she's than anyone but, but. else. Really great to have you back, Allison. Welcome. Thanks and for I'm having me. Introducing uh, Dr. Alina Joseph. Uh, Dr. Joseph is a scholar, a teacher, and a facilitator of race and communication. She's presidential term professor of communication, founding and acting director of the Center for Communication, Difference, and Equity, and associate dean of equity and justice in graduate programs at the University of Washington, Seattle. Relina is the author of numerous articles and three books, most recently with uh, Dr. Allison Briscoe-Smith, Generation Mixed Goes to School, which just came out this year. She's currently writing Interrupting Privilege, a book of essays based on her public scholarship. Glad to have her here as a first time guest. Welcome. And let me start uh, for both of you. I'll start with you, Allison, with the question we typically start with, which is in this case, um, Generation Mix Goes to School, Radically Listening to Multiracial Kids. What brought you, whether you want to share professionally or personally with us, what brought you to that topic? I mean, I think that the simplest answer was that this was um, uh, a braiding in of our experiences of our research, our service, and our personal lives. Um, really, and I, in addition to being, you know, colleagues and co-authors, are beloved friends and, and sister friends. Um, we love each other's families, take care of each other's families, or godparents for each other's families, and what brought us to this book was, you know, an opportunity to actually center the experiences of our children um, and to, to think about our kids who are experiencing and living through the world as multiracial folks. Um, so it was, again, we, we use this analogy of like a braid of, of moving things together. And so there was a professional space with Rulina as a, um, as a scholar in this kind of space around um, critical mixed race studies, understanding and thinking about the scholarship. There was my opportunity in thinking about things like implicit bias and, and clinical skills. But most importantly, we wanted um, an opportunity to spend more time with each other and to listen um, to our kids and our kids um, like them. And these were the places that we were curious. What, what are our kids going through? What do they want from their education? How are we armed and equipped to serve them. So that's how I would think about it. But a big, big excuse to spend more time with each other, which was which was also much needed. That's awesome, really. And I'm sure you would uh, agree with much of that. What would you add to that? 
No, absolutely. Um, and we we before before COVID, we did write much of this on writing retreats together. So it was just absolutely the best excuse to have to see each other. Um, and um, yeah, this was you know I uh, my first book was on on mixed race. I went to graduate school to study mixed race. Um, I, I my first identity is as a critical mixed race studies scholar, and um, the uh, Dr. James Banks who. Uh, is the father of multicultural education um, and the, the one who started this wonderful multicultural education series we were published in had approached me about writing this book. And I initially said no, because I couldn't imagine doing it by myself. And when I thought about the opportunity to, um, that it could be about our conversations, um, that, that actually we had legitimacy as scholars in this space, as well as mothers. And I think that's, that's the, what, some of what makes this book really so special is that um, we have this really personal um, voice in there. The children's voice is personal, our voice is personal. Um, and, and as Allison said, we're, we're braiding in um, these literatures that don't often talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you did a lot of, I want you to explain your, um, the title of it, of why Generation Mix at School and what you mean by radically listening, because we're going to spend some time um, listening to some of the folks you listen to. Um, so Rulina, could you take that question? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the first part of this is, you know, we're, we're looking at this um, post Mark one or, or more generation, right? This, this new 2000 census category of which um, all these, these children apply this different moment of racialization. Um, we can think about, you know, a post loving moment, right. And then this kind of post uh, Mark one or more moment. So this felt like this was really kind of a sea change in understanding how race and mixed race was articulated by a, a different group. And then the radical listening piece. So um, this, the center that I direct, the Center for Communication, Difference and Equity, we've been engaged for a number of years in these radical listening projects where we bring different communities in to share their stories around um, any number of topics. So we started off with the first time you've experienced uh, discrimination. We have stories of Black Seattleites. This last year we did things around um, Black folks uh, in quarantine, for example, that was called Quarantining While Black. And so it felt like this was a methodology. Um, so it's about how we uh, reciprocally bring people in, they get to choose who they'd like to speak with. So we don't dictate who um, is in conversation with each other. They get to actually choose that. There's also choice around uh, the questions. So they receive the questions in advance and they were able to script the questions as well. There's also choice then in that they receive the entire script of the interview and they're able to say, I want this highlighted, I don't like this highlighted. And then finally, we come together as a community to listen to the pieces and the participants actually get to invite in family, friends and other people who they really want to hear their stories. So it's a different way of really furthering listening and engagement for, um, for, for people whose stories don't always get told. I love that. Um, and so we're going to listen to a piece of tape from your project, and I wonder um, if you want to set it up at all. It's the grace to race to like who we're who we're hearing before we listen. So I mean, the thing that we want to highlight is what we did is we brought as as we was talking about, but but in practicality, we brought in kids with their siblings and their families to talk to each other. And so what you're going to hear here are two kids getting a chance to talk to each other. And you'll, you hear their, you know, I kind of want to leave it so that you can kind of hear it, but you'll hear that these are young children um, who are asking each other questions uh, about how they understand these concepts. And we feel like it's a, a beautiful window into understanding um, what's going on for kids. So I'll, I'll key it up in that way and we can talk a little bit about it after. Okay. That's good. Um, from grace to race. Um, but so we were asking a lot of different questions about race. Do you guys understand what race is? Yeah. Race, yes. What, what is it? It's something it's like, when you do like on on dinner or something, and then when you're at church, yeah. you could you no, say that's not grace. Uh, <laughs> let's yeah. say let's do it's race. Race, 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 color, race, skin color, oh, race. <laughs> 
Oh, race. Race, not so, race. So it's a skin color yeah. that people have. Yeah, and what kind of skin color do you guys have? Um, it's I, <laughs> I have Asian skin color, mm -hmm. kind of black. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I have. Yeah, and what about you? What do you have? I have like a yellowish white, Yeah. kind of a dark tan. So is that a question that you've ever gotten before where someone asks, what's your race? Yeah. Um, no. Yeah, so. Never before. Never before. So what do you say when people ask the question? Bless, Bless you. you. I usually tell them mm -hmm. about my parents. Mm -hmm. And what do you say? I tell them that my dad is mixed mm -hmm. and my mom is Korean. Mm -hmm. And your dad is mixed what? I don't, I think. I can't remember everything. Mm -hmm. His dad's mixed. Uh, she, he's, uh, he's white. He's American. He, I can't remember everything. He so is Filipino. He's a, he is Native American. Oh, uh, what Native American? Yeah. And then, and then he's Asian. Yeah, he's Asian. And then, and yeah. then he has a lot of relatives. Yeah, he has a really lot of them. Yeah. yeah. So what is so that's that's a great understanding of what your parents are. But what he says a famous person. Says I what think it is. I am. Uh, I'm just Asian. Just Asian. Yeah. And how do you think about yourself when you think about race? Well, I think I am Asian yeah. American. Yeah. And then different kinds because I have a long, long line of family. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's a lot of. That was great, and uh, so much to say about that. Uh, I wonder um, what the, you know, how this is typical or not typical of sort of what you've been hearing broadly, or what of themes that you've been hearing from mixed race kids. I mean, I I love this clip so much. We had an opportunity to hear so many different kids kind of talk and, and think together. The, there's so many reasons, I can't help but smile, just like they were ridiculously cute kids. Um, you can actually see something that we heard a lot, which is how kids' siblings are co-constructing their identities together. And so that's actually something that I didn't, um, I don't think we thought we would find or thought we would hear, but we got to see that, that siblings are teaching each other about it. It's also funny, right? And, and it also gives us a window into little kids are making sense of the world around them. Yes, in terms of race, but also, it's confusing, right? It's it's moving. It's these different kinds of pieces. You know, I love the way he talks about um, nationality and race and history. So I think what it gives us a window into is the kind of complexity that's there, but also how family is co-constructing. It wasn't as if these kids didn't have a sense of, as he says, the long history, the lots of people. Um, it also, they had a claim sense of identity. They had multi, multiracial and there was still a claim sense of an Asian identity, an Asian skin color. So I think this is, um, I could go on and on, but I think the thing that this shows is, I'll speak about the research, is it's pretty consistent with the research that young children, and I believe he was six or seven, really that can help me with that. Um, they're, not, they're nine and 10. I actually, I, I just looked in the back of the book in our index. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't remember, yeah. So they're, they're little, right, in some ways, you know, but this is consistent, that kids are trying to make sense of race, that they are looking at it, they're being impacted by it, but also the new kind of piece in terms of the literature is actually speaking about the ways that kids are co-constructing their identity. And what you see here is the opportunity for the older child to scaffold and to help. And the key part is to do this in the context of joy and connection. There's laughter, and what you can kind of hear in the background is they're coloring. You know, they're coloring in the midst of all this. They're doing all of this kind of piece in the background. So I think it's a great window um, to hear that these conversations are happening in family. There is joy as much as there's been a, within the research, a sense of kind of over pathologizing the experiences of multiracial kids. There are places of joy and resilience and, and support for each other. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I love this piece uh, so much. Yeah, I can really relate to it, you know, as a multiracial person, just um, the question you get, you know, sort of what are you when people have those curiosities just going right to your parents, you know, and going to nationality and well, my mom, well, my, and you're and, and Allison, I think that was you asking, but what about you, you know, and, and I think so often with mixed race kids, they're kind of, um, yeah, it's, it's really challenging or they're not supported in, in the what about you part, right? Yeah, Relina? 
I just wanted to give a quick shout out to our research assistant who was doing the recording there. We actually had two, just happened to have two multiracial research assistants as well. This was Anjali Brecky, who's now a professor at um, University of Wisconsin Parkside and my, uh, the other um, research assistant, Michelle Sturgis, who did a tremendous job here with, um, with this work and really carefully clipped out as you heard the clip and the music and the professional that was Anjali. Um, but they, they really did a, a wonderful, a wonderful uh, job with this caring work. Well done. Did you want to add anything to what Allison said? Um, uh, no, I, I think that she, she said it all. The only other thing I was, uh, so I, I did, of course, but um, <laughs> the, the, one of the unexpected things that, that we came into this book, you know, having a very clear picture of, we want to write it this way. And we kind of narrate that in the beginning. And of course, um, we end up letting um, our data speak to us. And it told us a very different story than what we wanted to write. And one of the stories was about siblings. And we didn't realize there was going to be so much here about siblings and how multiracial siblings were really teaching each other um, in a, a lot of ways more than what their parents were teaching them or even the schools were teaching them. And it was it was particularly interesting in moments when the kids were racialized differently because there were a number of conversations that we heard where one child was talking about, well, you're racialized this way, I'm racialized this way, this happens to me, this doesn't happen to you. People ask you what you are, people assume that you're black, they don't assume this, and they were figuring it out together. And so we felt really honored to have that, that view into the sibling lives um, in ways that really aren't reflected by mm -hmm. the literature. So um, we felt like this was a really an interesting piece that we're bringing, and these are, are the littles here. Um, but we hear it kind of more um, exposed in some of the teen pieces. And I think we're gonna hear another piece with, that shows us kind of an older sibling pair as well. Yeah, we're about to hear another piece. I just wanted to do a quick follow-up on that one. So these two, you said, Relina, really, were nine and 10, right? So they're pretty close in age. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, of course there could be many differences across si siblings with, you know, age, yeah, differently racialized or not. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, did you find that the uh, younger had as much to do, had much power in the co-creation as the older child, generally? There's, I mean, we heard about this in, in kind of different ways. Uh, what I was really impacted by was um, actually how much weight the older had, how much of a burden the older had um, often. So it wasn't in that the, there was a lot of kind of responsiveness to what the older, what the younger was bringing, but there was a kind of tendency that I saw and actually heard about um, narrated both by younger children or the, the younger sibling, which is, I learned a lot faster mm. or I had to do this much quicker or I had the opportunity to learn because there was someone ahead of me. The other kind of piece to kind of add to the kind of complexity is um, that these children are racialized really differently. We have, you know, as, as was kind of uh, mentioned that this was the part, you know, that they were talking to each other about, how do you understand your race? How do you identify? So I wanna be clear, we weren't asking them, what are you? I, I saw that within the chat. That's not what the question was. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do you understand this? Mm -hmm. And what does this mean for you? So the sibling kind of piece, and actually the, uh, we also had other, other people in family, my auntie, my, my cousin, there was this kind of familial socialization, this familial holding. But I'd say, you know, in, in general, I did find that there was both a burden and expectation on the olders, and also this kind of general narration that the younger ones were kind of coming up quicker, in part because mm -hmm. they were seeing what was happening for their for their older sibling um and then again holding on to the big variation that we have which is that kids in their families um got racialized differently according to how they looked how they presented in their own identity right and, and i know from uh, reading the book as well that um not only did you not ask you know what are you right uh, you asked um uh, they got to choose their prompts and their different prompts you chose people to be to talk to based on their having, um, you know, parentage of, that was varied, right? As opposed to kids who themselves identified as multiracial, is that right? Mm -hmm. right. Um, and I wonder if they're just following up on Andrew, if you found that um, the kids were more accepting of having different racial identities as siblings than sort of parents were or families, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, 
that our, I think that our, our kids were really attuned to how they were racialized, right? And so um, it really went alongside, I, I'm racialized as Black. And so this is a part of the way in which I go about the world. Um, we also wanna be clear that racialization shifts. So for some kids, it was a different type of racialization at school and a different type at home. And this fluidity, while it might seem confusing to adults and perhaps to monoracial adults was not confusing to the kids. They understood how they were, how they were navigating this space. Um, and we had some older teens who talked about as an elementary school kid, I identify particularly um, multiple minority kids. So kids who were Filipino and black, for example, as an elementary school kid, I identified as, as, as Filipino and then I identified as black and now I identified as Blasian. And, and all of these identities make sense to me. But then sometimes I'll go into a space, I'll say that I'm actually, um, you know, uh, back what I used to identify as, and this was kind of a singular and a continuous type of a space. But with monoracial parents, um, it was a bit harder. And we saw this in particular with some, um, with some white mothers uh, who um, in particular did not want their multiracial African-American sons uh, identifying as black. And um, we, we spent a lot of time kind of grappling with what we were trying not to simply read as anti-blackness, but to understand as a desire for protection of, the, of their child um, that was ultimately futile, right? Uh, but that that ended up um, feeling a lot like anti-blackness. Mm -hmm. So that's a generous interpretation. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> right? We, we, we worked we hard tried. on we worked hard on that, but it did, it did really come up. And you know, you asked a question about like what the radical listening is really about, and and that was it. Which is both that the radical listening, as Melina mentioned, was that we had a plan for the book, we had an outline. Then we listened and then the kids blew up our book, right? Like we had to reorganize and reshift. Mm -hmm. That was also the kind of piece too, um, that what we're encouraging here is the radical listening of our children and to, to multiracial children, which is that many times the children were voicing things that were distant at what the parents wanted, including their identity. Mm -hmm. And that a radical listening means slowing down, mm -hmm. listening deeply to what is being said, paying attention to the power and staying uncomfortable. And so in this context of the, the frames kind of um, generous interpretation, it's in part because those were um, folks that for whatever reasons weren't able to, to lean into the discomfort. The discomfort meant that their children had a proximity to blackness, um, were identified and saw themselves as black. And they were also therefore subject to oppression and racism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was a desire um, implicitly or explicitly that, there, that um, their whiteness would protect them. So, um, you know, that's what we mean. It's like, this is uncomfortable um, and can be challenging. And, but if we really need to center the voices of what kids are saying, they're telling us, I felt like I was this in third grade and this in fifth grade and I'm this now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you have another great clip that we'd like to get to. And of course, people have lots of questions so I'm not asking you to respond to this now, but that last point about you know moms of uh, um, you know multiracial children with black parents uh, with with a black parent raises this question of you know the differences right the many differences within the category of multiracial identity. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So often it shows up as one you know as if I mean, we know that you know, right all racially defined groups have uh, loss of variation within them. Sometimes it feels like that is lost with respect to multiracial, right? And that the experiences can be quite different. So I just want to put a pin in that and make sure we get back to at least a couple pieces within it. But would you like to, uh, yeah, situate this next clip for us? Really so know, it's, maybe. It's about yes, sure, yeah. yeah. So I think we are about to hear um, a clip. This is a, a, a teenage uh, participant. She is, I think, 16 here, and she's sharing a story about what happened at school with, um, with her 10-year-old sister and with us. I remember in eighth grade, but there was a teacher. It was at lunch, and I was the only Black kid in the classroom that I was eating in with 
class full of white kids. And of course, out of all the people, he asked me a question saying, do you know how Richard Sherman's dreadlocks work? And I said, well, they're braids that are left in for a long time. And he was like, oh. They don't really come out. And yeah, and he was like, oh, cool. And like, just basically saying a bunch of stuff about dreads and Richard Sherman and how his, one of his dreads fell out. And I was just like, okay. And I just remember feeling very pointed out in that moment because everyone looked at me when he asked me that question. And I just felt like really on the spot. And I was a little bit embarrassed to be, not embarrassed, but the fact that he pointed me out in front of everybody just Mm -hmm. wasn't the best experience. Mm -hmm. How do you understand why he did what he did? Well, because I'm black and so I must know what dreads are. None of the kids in the class know what it is, even though Richard Sherman is a famous football player. Everyone knows who he is, but let me just ask the one black person in this room who would know, so. You know, that also makes me think about this kind of question about how is it that your teachers see you? So in that moment, do you think he saw you as black, as mixed? I definitely think he saw me as black in that moment, Mm -hmm. in that basically I know everything about black hair and all black people, you know, I must know what Richard Sherman's hair is, I must know what dreadlocks are, Mm -hmm. because, because of the way my skin color is, Mm -hmm. I have to know. He didn't even know my name, so he was just like, you. What do you want to communicate with teachers Um, and schools about what black kids, what mixed kids need? Not pointing out kids, like not putting them on the spot, not judging them, not... Not like, hey you, tell me what this person does. Help teach the class about this person because I don't know and I'm supposed to teach you about this because they're black. Mm-hmm. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people get taught to teach. They should also be taught how to teach certain lessons and say certain things. And you know, not everybody knows that. Especially even teachers. Teachers make mistakes. Teachers point kids out, teachers Mm -hmm. say say things they aren't supposed to, and I think that's a boundary that they shouldn't be passing and that they should learn about. And maybe sometimes teachers will put people on the spot because maybe they'll like pick someone over you even if you're smart. They'll probably think like, oh, black people aren't smart because they're dumb, and white people are always smart, so I should call in this person. And then they never get your opinions about something that you might actually have a really good opinion on something. Mm. Has that happened to you in class before? No, I usually get picked a lot because I just raise my hand all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I've been in what? games a lot of times because I raise my hands all the time and they'll be like, you, oh, you've already been in it. I'm like, oh, sorry, yeah, I have. <laughs> For you, just a hand up. <laughs> Sounds like you make your voice heard. Wow, that was great. Um, Rolina, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure that um, uh, multiracial kids who are identified racialized as Black and a lot of Black kids can relate to, you know, parts of that. So um, what's special about the experience of the multiracial kid there? Yeah, we, I mean, I think that you really see the sibling dynamic that Allison was talking about earlier there, um, that that the younger sibling, you know, who's six years younger is really learning how to protect herself against racism by hearing her older siblings' um, stories, right, and talking about, and this is actually how we, we love this so much that we use this um, in our way out of the book about her, like, she just always raises her hand. We're like, that's what we want. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that, that this, this kind of prediction um, of, of understanding racism and this kind of even this prediction moment is not going to be a negative, but rather is going to help stoke her um, confidence. Uh, and this is also a family, and we talk a bit about this, that's very clear in talking about race. They have a big 
they have talked about how the the older daughter casually used the N word, and and dad was like, uh, stop. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna do some reading together. We're gonna have a big conversation. This is, and they, this was their weekend spent on, you know, what does it mean for our family to use the N word? And so this, this when the whole family is engaged in conversations around race and racism, um, how it can really be this protective factor for children. Mm -hmm. Allison, do you want, I know you want to add Allison, so I'm giving you space. You know me very well. I mean, I think the things that really, there's so much that kind of stands out, again, the ways that siblings are kind of doing this together. Um, again, I think just the, to lean in a bit to the pain in the moment, we had a whole kind of like, framing around a chapter about what it means to be singled out, right? How, what it means to, to be kind of called in that kind of way. Um, and then, you know, what it means to kind of be spotlight. And the basic thing we need to listen to is it doesn't feel good. Um, this um, young woman, in addition to a number of the kids that we talked with, said things like, I wish our teachers were trained better. I wish they were supported better. And so that's a very explicit call, right? For supporting teachers that they're, what kids are asking for is like, you know, hey, you're supposed to be able to take this on and help me with this. And what's ending up happening is that I, as a kid, am getting tasked with, with handling all of this. So there's that kind of piece. Um, and the other part is, uh, again, that we kind of highlight throughout the book, but I think that this, the younger sibling so um, wonderfully illustrates is the agency that kids have, the, the resistance that the kids have, but also to just hold on for a moment and think about like, and this needs to be marshaled every day, right? Is to kind of show up and to keep on raising the hand, right? So I, I think there's just a lot that kind of shows up within these kinds of pieces. This is why actually listening was so rich. And so you can hear us like, you know, we're laughing, there are times we're crying. Um, you know, we have, you know, the, the, the graduate assistants who were helping us also had their own lived experience. So you know, want to say that this was not some sort of like controlled scientific, this was scientific in terms of the centering of voices and really being able to listen. So um, I could go on, but I, I just think it's really, I always, you know, feel really impacted by hearing about these, these kids um, experiences and what they're doing about it. Right, right. Yes. So I mean, one question I have is about surprises. Right, so clearly there were some already for even for you, right? As mm -hmm. two mixed race people who have mixed race children, uh, and have done a lot of work in this space, um, but there were surprises. I'm wondering what else, and what are some of the the big takeaways for the folks who haven't picked up your book yet? I think that for me, one was one of the huge, not not huge surprises. I don't know if this is a surprise, but I was. Um, I was dismayed by it, um, but every one of our kids who was um, part black talked about implicit bias, um, mm -hmm. uh, without a doubt, and um, talked about being punished in schools. Um, talked about differential, um, differential, uh, you know, being recesses taken away, being given detentions, um, uh, not not being, uh, you know, given explanations for math problems and watching this happen in various ways. And so to see this um, with all of our kids who are racialized as black um, was, um, was I think that we 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 knew this, but to to hear it over and over again, and to hear kind of eerily similar stories was 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 disturbing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There there was a, a another interview you all did with um, two I think brothers who were half Asian and half white. We can point everyone to the great tape, um, but who talked about being singled out as well. And then, and then said, well, we're luckier than most kids. Like they were very aware of a racial hierarchy um, because we mostly pass for white, but kids from other groups, you know, who get racialized differently, they get singled out a lot more. So that was really interesting. Like this is happening and everyone's, all the kids are seeing it, you mm -hmm. know? And, um, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times adults don't think the kids are seeing it or want to believe that or don't think you know, if a kid's saying my teachers need training in this, you know, it's pretty clear that this is happening at school, that this is important, but um, mm -hmm. not in the training, right? So mm -hmm. really interesting stuff. I, I mean, no, go oh, no, I was just gonna say that that actually speaks to um, Andrew, what you were talking about as kind of our teaser before we went into the clip to me, 
um, that the true dangers, I, I know this is probably not the audience to say this in front of, but I am not a proponent of a multiracial category. Um, I think that it actually is a is like a truly flattening device. I think that there's a way for us to do multiple levels of, of data collection so that people can be multiracial and, but what we know, and we, we've known this from plenty of other scholars, but um, the multiracial Asian and particularly Asian American and white experience is, um, is fundamentally different, right? In terms of voting patterns, in terms of life chances across a variety of things. And so we talk about with those brothers, for example, this experience of white adjacency, right? And how they're very conscious of it and are not trying to use it in, um, in a way that, that is, um, is evil, but they, they understand how power is operating, right? And then how to kind of insert themselves in a way in which the kids who are part African-American are not provided with that luxury, mm -hmm. right? And so for, for us thinking about, you know, uh, an upper middle class kid who is Japanese American and white versus um, a working class kid who might be Samoan and black. And for those two children to be categorized by a school system as the same is, is troubling to me. It's actually troubling to me. And we, when we hear the stories telling, our experiences are incredibly different here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's troubling to the kids as, to, as well. You know, it's troubling to the kids that they're actually saying that their experiences are different and different is okay. So this flattened categorization, it's also embedded in this idea as if multiraciality is some sort of way out mm -hmm. of experiencing bias. And so that's in part why we, what we learned from listening at what we also found within the, the research, you know, is that it's, it's not, it's not some sort of way out. This is not some sort of, you know, the increasing proximity to whiteness is not some sort of way out of this, especially when kids, and this is what we also heard, so many kids make agentic choices about when they would claim and use whiteness and also when they wouldn't. And how many times we heard kids, um, we have another story of a multiracial uh, uh, Asian kid who chooses an Asian identity, despite everybody else saying, no, maybe you should chooses and reaffirms and sticks to that. So there are these opportunities, but he's actually very clear that that choice comes with particular baggage. So it's not as if kids don't know, but this flattening kind of categorization is not some sort of way, way out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, Allison, there's, there's one more question I wanna stay with you. And it's, an, it's another sort of very blunt question, but I'm really interested in, um, you know, it's what's clear you've mentioned from the very beginning of this conversation that the kids, of course, know that they're being racialized. They know that they're racialized from a very early, uh, at a very early age, they know that they can talk about that, though obviously they don't use that language. They do it in a, but they recognize the nuances of their racialization and, and that there are a lot of sources, right? A lot of sources of input for that. And I'm wondering about, you know, as you distinguish between, I'm thinking about the distinction between their peers and what their peers, how their peers racialize, what that input looks like and feels like versus the adults in their lives, whether at home, at school, you mentioned the school and school mm -hmm. policies. Mm -hmm. you know, did you have a, did you come away with a sense of you know, the distinction that the kids themselves see and how they are racialized by the others, especially by generation? Yeah, I mean, I think if I were to jump in on like the shorthanded answer and, and Relina definitely help me out here, one of which is that like grown folks got to catch up. Um, so th there, there wasn't any kind of space that I heard a ton of folks saying, wow, I was incredibly helped by folks who had a different generational piece. In fact, when we asked kids to tell us about the grownups and the, the on campus that were really helpful, we got nothing. Mm -hmm. we, we really had to go back right? And to ask again. So I think that that's one. The second piece that we found is that um, the parents and the adults who really, really did connect mm -hmm. um, were uncomfortable and tried really hard. And so that was another lesson. We also heard that um, kids were really relying upon other peers. And in fact, asked pretty strategically for affinity spaces. To, to be with other, there's a number of places where we hear kids say something about, oh, you know, as I think about it, it turns out all my friends are mixed kids. All my friends, you know, there was this kind of sense that what they were being drawn to and what they were really being supported by were children 
in that kind of, we were having similar experiences. So it, what we asked in particular is what, what schools could do. What kids said is train your teachers as to how to have conversations and how to see me. Give us spaces to be together, right? Um, and allow us to be who we are. Uh, I think one of the quotes that stands out to me, and you know, uh, Melissa, I remember you and I talked about this a, a while back, is uh, you know, kids saying, "It's not as if I don't know who I am; it's that other people won't let me be." Um, so that I, I would say that those are the pieces that kept on kind of coming up again and again. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have so many questions from folks and, uh, and we sort of went over time. We can talk on that. Um, so you, we definitely are going to have to share all the resources on your sites and all that. Um, so a, a question, there are a lot of questions about um, like this. Um, how does one respond to a teen classifying herself as white when she's half Latino, half white? Uh, do kids unconsciously know from observing society that identifying as white brings certain privileges and higher social status? I'm going to say yes um, the, to, the, to the last part. But the, the question of how to identify, how to take it, you know, I think a lot of parents struggle with that. And, um, and I think particularly, I mean, it's for different reasons, you know. Um, some struggle if white isn't identified, others struggle, um, you know, if you're not, uh, if you're not identifying as black, and for example, instead of black, white, if that's your racial identity because of the politics of it, right? Um, so I'm wondering how to, how you all would think about the best response um, to mixed race kids who are choosing their identities. Carolina, what do you think? Yeah, I think when we and we've gotten this question quite a bit from from troubled parents, and it's interesting. It's often the the parent who does not want the child to identify as white, right, and is really upset about about their child identifying as white. Um, and I think that for one is that you know we're talking about listening to kids, so you want to hear about what that experience is like. Um, one of the things that, that Alice and I are, are trying to talk about is the importance and that you all are doing here so well is the importance of talking about race early and often and all the time, right? So that you're not in the position of what, um, I was talking to my hairdresser today about kind of awkward conversations about race that happen um, with white folks that she calls white people in. So that you're not, you're not in the moments where it's so awkward to talk about race that you're stumbling over your language, right? Um, Eduardo, sociologist Eduardo Bonilla Silva talks about this, is that you don't go into this space of rhetorical incoherence. And I don't know if this is this is this mom, but if, you, if you're not kind of having race as a part of a conversation all the time, um, you know, for, for Allison and myself and um, for, um, you know, we're godmothers to each other's uh, kids, race is something that we are able to joke about. Race is something that we're able to make transparent in all the different ways. Race is never off the table. Race is never something bad to identify. And so I think that to have conversations then about whiteness as well um, and, and whiteness as being a race and what does that mean? And what does it mean to choose whiteness in this space um, is to, to kind of to listen and to let the kid work that out and to see where that goes. And then I think for the parent also to talk about this is my racialized identity and this is how I came here. And was I always here? I don't know. Um, and that's one of the things that we do actually in the book is that we provide different exercises for, um, for people to go through and to practice. Uh, and this is something that you could do with your kids as well. Thank you for that. You know, we have um, not surprisingly a bunch of questions too about how to support mixed race kids in the school context. Mm -hmm. um, and we have questions essentially both around what do I do? Uh, there's one person, presumably a teacher, who says that she manages affinity groups for the school and wants to create a mixed race affinity groups, both for students and for parents wondering what to do. And then someone else, also a teacher saying, what do I not do? What do I make sure not to do that teachers who mean well often do with respect to mixed, to mixed race kids? 
Allison, any thoughts on either either side of that? Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, uh, we hope and encourage folks will get a chance to connect up with the clips in the book in part because this is the focus. And, um, you know, it, part of it is we encourage these exercises, these practices that are very consistent with practices that teachers are really good at doing, which is, I think teachers are uniquely equipped to help kids feel like they belong. Mm -hmm. And they need practice at talking about race and thinking about race in complex manners. Um, and so I think it's about kind of getting a chance to kind of practice that. I'm really glad to hear that someone is saying that they're supporting affinity groups. That was very consistent about what kids wanted. Not only that, it was also um, very, very consistent that, um, that schools were saying no. Like, no, we can't have affinity group. No, that would make white people feel bad. So um, I actually think sharing the resources uh, about how to, to create affinity groups and we, we bring some of those resources to bear by listening to teachers who, who do it. What kids are hungry for is a sense of belonging and a sense of connection. Um, in terms of what not to do, uh, you know, the kids actually speak to that as well. Don't just be silent about it and don't presume that your silence is actually helping out. The, the kids are very, very specific that we need teachers who feel supported and equipped to, to talk about race and race difference and, and difference period. The, this idea that if I don't talk about it, it it'll go away is actually very painful. Um, I think last, a, a growth mindset around making mistakes and staying in connection is very important. We hear from so many folks, you know, I'm, I'm so scared to do the wrong thing. I'm so scared to say something. So then people end up silent or I'm so scared that my children are gonna be impacted by race. So my hope is that whiteness will protect them. The, the kids are very, very loud that it's not, it's not, it's not helping them, it's not protecting them. So there's, that was a whole lot, but I, I think it's in part because the conversations we had with kids were really nuanced and complex and their requests were very clear. We asked every kid, what do you want teachers to know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what do you want schools to do? Right. Um, so there are some teachers in your book that were really exceptional, you know, in creating that um, belonging for kids. And it made me, you know, we do have a lot of questions about that. Um, how do you curate a classroom in which children can explore their identity safely, you know, sort of along the same lines there. Um, and it does make me think about, um, about maybe was there someone named Mr. Daly or Mr. Day, Mr. Daly? Yeah. And there, there, he reminded me of, you know, we had some people who were uh, book folks, like reader folks talking about um, race, um, race in picture books and how to talk to kids and always when we have anything about books everyone wants a book list you know a book list about these kids these kids and the folks who were on um said and megan down that lambert was one of them said and hannah gomez said um you know we hate book lists if you really want to get something that your kid attaches to go to the librarian and talk about your kids interests your you know this 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 and I think that that's kind of a nice analogy. Like when you're curating your classroom, is it that you get out the book list that everyone's gonna have in their classroom and put those on the shelves? Or do you really talk to the kids about who they are? And that was something, I mean, what was special about Mr. Daly? Maybe one of you can talk about him a little bit. Yeah, he was really fantastic. If it's, if it's okay, actually, I pulled up because I wanted to share some of his words. Um, the, and this is how we start this chapter. I was I was saying that chapter four is really on these really special teachers. And who, as, as Allison points out, we ended our um, 
our, our interviews saying, you know, the well, who are the teachers that are really um, impactful and what we wanted to, to attach this question of belonging, who makes you feel like you, you belong at school. And we got this nothing, nobody. Um, and so we had to return back and, and Mr. Day was one of the ones who, who came back and, um, and, and uh, the students really uh, identified with. And so he, he teaches at a large racially diverse um, public high school. And so he started off for us, he said that for him, relationship is key. Um, he quotes uh, Maya Angelou and says, people will forget what you say, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. He notes, all the content that I do is important and it'll be beneficial for students in their educational career and maybe their professional career. Um, but what makes them actually, quote, consider myself the most successful is if my students come to my space and they feel like they feel seen, they feel validated, and they feel like they were treated as more than just a person who was supposed to be graded. He says that, especially for a lot of students of color, if you have that established relationship, you can be talking about how paint dries and students are more likely to roll with you. They may not roll with the content naturally because they're not interested in it, but if you're talking to them about it, they're gonna follow you and they're gonna work with you because they appreciate you. So he, um, so I just, just is in terms of context, when I was interviewing him, our interview kept on getting disrupted because students kept on opening up the door and being like, hi, Mr. Day, hi, Mr. Day. They wanted to see him. They wanted to get acknowledged by him. Um, he is a mixed race African-American teacher and he, he started off by talking about his own journey. And um, that meant such a tremendous amount to all of the students um, who uh, really formed kind of an unofficial affinity group around him, including um, a couple of our participants. Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, let me ask another question. Um, and we've gotten to some variations on this. And the basic idea is, did gender or other uh, sort of personal group identities shape racial socialization and, and kids' attitudes toward all of this? Yep. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yep. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, you know, the, the uh, gender did, skin color did hair color did, um, neighborhood, school composition. There were all of these um, roads into identity. Um, we, you know, in the beginning, like, in part paid attention, not, uh, lifted up the stories around black boys, in part because of the ways in which their risk is particular, right? And it's not as if other kids don't have risk too. There's a risk for black girls um, as well, but it, it, it is an intersectional experience. So gender definitely played um, a lot, as did all these other factors, right? Uh, so many parents talked about um, where are we going to choose to send our kids to school? You know, where will they be seen? Where could they possibly be seen? So many parents talked about the issues of feeling the need that they had to choose between either diversity or um, a quote unquote good school. Um, and then hearing kid, the kids knew that these are the decisions that were being made too. Um, so yeah, it, it's all of those factors, gender, neighborhood, school, class, um, were very impactful for the experiences. Mm -hmm. We're getting, by the way, in the questions and we did earlier as well, but sort of live and earlier, a lot of people saying, Oh my gosh, you know, I have mixed race adults saying I'm so, you know, I've been waiting for this conversation forever and it's great to hear experiences like mine. Um, so there's there's really a lack of interest, uh, not interest, but research around this, right? And sort of there's more and more conversation, but it does feel like, um, yeah, people are hungry for more. So we're glad that you um, created this book. Um, there are uh, questions around the, um, you know, what are you question that's racially ambiguous kids get. And um, I, I was fascinated in the book that you brought some of the, the science behind sort of people's responses um, to uh, mixed race kids or particularly those that they see as racially ambiguous. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about that. And Lelina, could you tell the, the story about the, that class evaluation you got as well? 
Yeah, yeah, this is kind of a, 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 a typical experience for me. Um, so one of the stories that I tell in the book as we're talking about in particular racial ambiguity and this what are you question is that when I was uh, when I was an assistant professor so many years ago um, and I was at Pellet, this is like maybe about 14 years ago, um, teaching a large lecture class and I got the, we call them the dreaded yellow sheet. So that's when people could do their long, long hand comments. And I got one that said, if you just told me what you were, I could focus better in class. Uh, which I thought was just really, really interesting that this, this student, we we're in a quarter system over the course of, of 10 weeks, 20 lectures, was just somehow so focused on trying to figure out my racial background as opposed to all of the brilliance that I was, you know, speaking on those days. Um, and we know that, um, that there is actual, I did not know this uh, at all until I started working with, with Dr. Briscoe Smith here. Um, so Al, I don't know if you want to just share some of the science behind this. Yeah. So what we were able to do is to bring it together, like, um, that's a painful and salient quote that um, was actually really a, a moment of truth telling. Mm -hmm. There is, you know, um, brain science that actually shows that people become kind of tapped out if they can't figure out the category of the person in front of them. And this, um, now I, I say like brain science gets tapped out, but I also want to say, but, but we, can, we can overcome that. It's not necessary. To, to place it, right, to, to place another person. It's really about a person's discomfort at not being able to tell who the person is across from them. And, you know, I think anyone that is multiracial or is read as multiracial or has the experience has felt that, that, that desire of the person across from them to try to categorize, mm -hmm. to test, to figure it out and to place them. So again, I'm, I'm operating as much as I can with generosity about what that is um, because it manifests very painfully and it manifests as we detail within the book with some pretty significant consequences. Things like, hmm, if you were only to, you know, you should probably pay more attention to basketball because clearly that's who you are. Or the research that indicates that when you place multiracial folks who are multiracial black and white in particular dress, that there's an association of, um, of class and intelligence because, oh, now I can finally read you. So these things do show up, um, but it's people's inability to kind of manage their brain a bit that moves them to the place of need to categorize. And what we're actually really hoping for is that people pause a moment, listen a moment, and pay attention to the other things that might help you figure out whether or not you can connect. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, like if that person missed out on the brilliance that, that Dr. Joseph has to offer, right? Because it's uncomfortable. Be uncomfortable and figure it out. Like these kids are figuring it out. We can do this as well. And I mean, the, I mean, the, the flip side, right? The flip side of many people's unease with the racial ambiguity, right? Or not being able to figure it out mm -hmm. is that, right? You think about, we also have lots of research on this, how readily, right, how quickly we assess, right, racial identity, gender identity, and age within a split second of meeting someone, no matter how fleeting, right? So, you know, when I think of sometimes I check myself or I ask others, you know, that person that you checked out when you checked out the food, you bought the candy bar or whatever, you encounter someone you don't know, it was fleeting. People can virtually always say, well, this is what I thought, right? I thought it was a man, I thought it was roughly this age, and I thought it was right that racial category. And if I don't know, yes, yeah, so that sense right. of weight I wasn't able to place. Right. I mean, if that doesn't speak to the investment we have in those categories, I don't know what does. Right. And and imagine as you have and as you've listened, you know, kids experiencing that when they know who they are, but they they still get this like, you know, this confusion and this um this pain that you see in people's faces. Anyway, um, thank you. Yeah, this has Another been a great conversation. Allison, you you remain on the roll. You've been on from the beginning. 
Yeah, Carlina, and you brought us Carlina. Carlina, so yeah, good we to have meet more you. Conversations. Amazing yeah, work. Yeah, really lovely um, to be with you both and with everyone here. Uh, we'll send you, you know, all the links to these guys, and uh, you know, the video and transcript will be coming. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank for you being so here. much for doing this work and for sharing yeah, it with I us. Yeah, really appreciate it. It's really hit home. Well, thanks for providing the space and this wonderful resource and this opportunity to talk. And it's been great to partner with you all. And thanks also to the folks that are doing the hard and much needed work of um, interpretation um, and making sure that this is accessible to our, um, you know, our broader community. So, so thank you all for this work. Yeah, we, really we definitely got excited and uh, spoke too quickly at times. But I know. Sorry. Thank I you know. so Sorry. much. Sorry. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.